Good morning again, because it's still a good morning. Good morning. Um, we are going to continue with our, our testify a series. I don't know, it's just kind of ongoing. It's not really a series. And so today I have asked uh, Richard Teal if he would be willing to come up and, and share with us uh, the testimony of, of God in his life. So, Richard, I will turn this over to you. I can start this by Richard isn't really willing. <laughs> the Lord is. And I thought I was going to do all right until that last song. <laughs> now the only thing holding me up here is the Lord. I have some notes which I can't see. <laughs> I was introduced to Jesus at a very young age by a lady that taught. Uh, now I'm falling apart. That did the news, Good News Club. Her name was Mrs. Hadley. And I can see her. And, and I knew at that time that uh, if I believed in Jesus, I was saved. But I walked a long time, with, and I know the Lord was right beside me, but I didn't listen. And I just walked in my own selfish pride. And uh, I know this because I talk to people that I grew up with, and uh, a lot of them know me as a quite arrogant young man. And I'm pretty sure in my own re recollection I was. And, uh, I got married to my first wife and had a couple of kids, which at that time I really didn't know the Lord well enough to lead my family, and therefore that, that didn't last more than about 14 years, and things didn't go real good, and we split up, and I really, you know, I just kind of let my children down. And I've been trying to make up for that, but that's the best I can do, is try. It was kind of after that, in my middle ages, that I really started to uh, walk with the Lord and want to. And at that time, I, I spent a lot of time thinking that I wanted to find that button that you push that just turns you off. So I just see the Lord, and I realized that that button doesn't exist. <laughs> I actually got there to know the Lord enough, and, and through reading the Bible and some really good mentors been in my life, because Romans 12:1 says the Lord wants you to become a living sacrifice and choose Him continually. I've tried. I've learned a lot. I met my second wife, and uh, Diane and I were married for several years. You know, a lot of you know Diane. Her and I moved here a number of years ago. And uh, I still wasn't really devoted to the Lord completely at the, at the beginning of that marriage. And as I walked through it, I made lots of mistakes. And I'm thankful towards the end of it, which most of you know that it's been in the last few years that that went to pieces and uh, there are a number of other things in my life that haven't went real well. That I've had uh, a lot of support from a lot of you and a lot of support from the Lord and I've come to realize and depend on the Lord and uh, one of the biggest things I learned is it's not about me, it's about the people around me. And it just, one of the other big things is uh, our Lord is a gracious teacher. He doesn't really mind giving us the same test over and over until we get it. Sometimes that's not always fun, and then 
about the time you think you've got it, you'll throw a pop quiz in there and show you that you really don't. <laughs> then you go again. But he's, you know, from, I realized from the good news club that he's always been there. He's always carried me. And in the last few years, I've, I've really wanted to uh, do his will. And uh, a big realization of that. Um, when we sing the praise song, like the last one, I was doing good to that. <laughs> but the words to the song are, are how my heart feels. And I just, I thank the Lord for everything in my life. I thank the Lord for all of you. Because uh, when I moved here, I kind of went through the, I think it was a newspaper and phone book to find a church. And my wife at that time, Diane, helped me and looked at this one and looked at this one. I went, well, this one or this one? And she goes, well, not that one, this one. And so I came here on Sunday and I put, just like my church that I had left or I had been living, put tears in my eyes. <laughs> I don't remember whether it was Vivian or Mary Lou that brought me to Kleenex and welcome. But I appreciate your support. Thank you very much. And I love the Lord with all my heart. Amen. I think I'm going to change the order of service from now on and do you guys' testimonies after. <laughs> That's really hard to follow. It's just a, I love hearing how God works with people. I mean, he's so intimate, you know? I mean, he's involved. He's right there with us. And, you know, I've been a big fan for years of that, you know, the poem, The Footprints in the Sand. And, you know, there's where we walk together, and oh, I, there's only one set of footprints. Well, that's where I carried you. I've been a good, big fan, but I read something the other day that I think is probably more appropriate for my life. And as we walked through the sand, I looked back and I found a bunch of furrows and kicked up. And I said, well, what's that? And God said, well, that's where I drug you. <laughs> I think sometimes he drags us. <laughs> always right there with us. Always right there with us. So thank you very much. Um, we are in Colossians. And so I'm going to ask you, if you would, um, open up your Bible to Matthew. <laughs> it's in Colossians, so I want to start with Matthew. If you would, open to Matthew chapter 7. By the way, did anybody else notice that he took his glasses off and put them back on? Thank you, Richard. I mean, there's only a few of us elect that take off our glasses to read. Matthew chapter 7, I'm going to start in verse 13. Jesus is speaking. He says, Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. Now, I want to... This actually came up earlier this week. I was speaking with a, a man that is involved in a ministry locally. And, and uh, I love his heart. But I don't think he understands... Scripture. Because he made a very good point. You know, there's approximately 1% of the valley that is dedicated to Christ. And he, he is convinced 
that we will get that number to 90 percent. And I'm sorry, but Scripture tells us that few are those who find it. Few. There's an elect few. Um, but that's not why I wanted to read this passage. I was actually reading this passage after my conversation with him, and, and I thought just how perfectly it fits with what I want to say today in Colossians. You ever wonder why the way is hard? It's narrow and it's hard. Why is it so difficult to be a Christian? Because, I mean, becoming a Christian is a piece of cake. You give up the rights to your life, you accept him, you believe in him, you confess him, you're a Christian. And then it gets rough. Because you got to die. you got to give up who you are. You know? And, and But we take on something so much better. So much better. We take on his nature. Um, quite honestly, if you had the choice to sit in a room with me or Jesus, I would recommend you take Jesus. Because <laughs> I would. If it was you and Jesus, I'd take Jesus. But the, the cool thing about it is if I sit in a room with you and you really are one of his, I'm sitting in a room with Jesus. Amen. He, he lives in us. He's promised us that he will be with us. So flip over, if you would, to Colossians chapter 2. Starting in verse 16, I'm going to read all the way to the end of the chapter. It's my intent to finish chapter 2 today. We'll see how that goes. Starting in verse 16, Colossians 2, 16. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink, or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. These are shadows of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism, and worship of angels going on in detail about visions, puffed up without reason by a sensuous mind, and not holding fast to the head, from whom the whole body, nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments, grows with the growth that is from God. If with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations, do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, referring to things that are perished as they are used? excuse me, referring to things that all perish as they are used, according to human precepts and teachings. These have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. <laughs> We're going to talk about something that I believe is why the narrow way is so hard today. Why is it so difficult? Why is it so few find it? Because I read this. Let's start off here. He says, therefore. What's the therefore, therefore? Why is he starting off with this? Now, because keep in mind, when Paul wrote this, this was a continuous thought with what went before and what comes after. It's all one letter. There weren't chapters and verses. And so when Paul says, therefore... You have to look back up ahead of you to see why, what is the therefore, therefore? Well, last week we talked about the awesome victory of the cross. I mean, the center point of what we are all about. That Jesus died for our sins. That he was nailed to a cross and through the cross made public spectacle, a mockery of all the authorities and the rulers of this earth. Now, I'm not talking governmental, civil, military rulers. I'm talking about the spiritual powers of this earth. You know, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We wrestle against what? Principalities and powers, wickedness, rulers. Okay? That's what we're wrestling against. We're not wrestling against this person or that person or this ideology or that ideology. Our war 
is waged on a plane that we very rarely even see because it deals with the spirits. Okay? Boy, it's acted out in our flesh. We do get to see the outcome of it, the results of it, but to see the actual warfare, you know it's, it's an exciting thing to be in the army of God. Amen. I always thought the, the Air Force was the only branch of the armed services that got it right. Because <laughs> they take the, air, the uh, officers, they stick them in a plane and send them to the lines to get shot at. And the enlisted men stay at the back and fill up the planes with gas. <laughs> now every other branch, the officers stay up behind and tell the enlisted men, go up there and see if a guy's got a grenade. I thought the Air Force got it right. Let the officers say, hey, you're going to make the call, you go do it. I thought that was right. right. I thought that was wisdom. But check out the army of God. All right. Look at what he does. You know, when he comes back again, and he's going to assert his dominance, establish his authority on earth, he's bringing all of those who are faithful to him back with him. And what are they going to do? We're going to come as an army, and all we're going to do is cheer him on. Because he's going to slay them with the word and sword of his mouth. He's going to do it. He's the only one that is going to fight. You get that? He doesn't need us. He doesn't need my tactical acumen. He doesn't need your ability with a rifle or a sword. We're along for the ride. That's the kind of army that we belong to. And Jesus, at the cross, made public spectacle. I love the way that this reads. He says, uh, in verse 15, he says, He disarmed the rulers and authorities. They no longer have any weapon to warfare. They have, no longer have any power. Okay, they're disarmed. And put them to open shame by triumphing over them in Him. Now, what do you do with a person that you can't keep dead? Well, we kill him. And there he is. You can't keep him dead. Now, not only did you kill him and you can't keep him dead, but you can't touch him. You, you can't do anything to him. Now, what about his followers? You look in Acts, and this, I love this in Acts, and I hope someday, if it ever gets to this point, I have the courage that these men in Acts hit. But I love it. You guys better stop preaching or we're going to beat you. Amen, praise God, we're going to be beaten. Uh, well, okay, so you better stop or we're going to kill you. Praise God even more. We're going home better to be with him than to be with you. How do you discipline someone like that? You can't. I mean, really. What do you do with them? I don't know. But Jesus disarmed them. He made a public spectacle of them. Okay? So, therefore, the whole therefore is predicated on the idea that he is triumphant. Okay, because he has triumphed, let no one pass judgment on you in question of food and drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. Now, people, I'm going to tell you some difficult things here today. And I want you to carry it before God. Okay? And I'm, I'm telling you right up front, I got a small brain. Okay? And this is my understanding of how I see this working. Okay? I might be wrong. I might be wrong. So you got homework to do. But you guys got to be like the Bereans and go check and see if I'm wrong. Okay? Now, I'm not asking you to go solicit somebody else's opinion. You know, my grandpa used to have a saying about opinions. They're like armpits. Everybody's got them and they all stink. Okay? I'm not asking you to go look at somebody else's opinion. I'm asking you to get into God's Word and see what it would say to you. Okay? Because I have the same spirit in me that you have in you. It should be leading us in the same direction. Alright? So, here we go. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you. You ever met a church that you had to dress a certain way or wear or not wear certain items and, you know, in order to be a member in good standing of that church, you had to look a certain way? Well, um, I would hope you, most of you would say yes. Uh, 
Uh, I remember being in several churches that way. Um, you know, I grew up in a church in, in Colorado, and in the winter, you wore clod hoppers and jeans. Because when you went to church, you most likely had to dig somebody out of the snow and push them into the parking lot. And when church was over, you had to push them out of the parking lot back to the road. And it's hard to do in slick, fancy shoes. So we would wear clod hoppers. And my dad, my dad was a, a, a man, he's a servant. And he had no problem being the master servant and teaching us kids to be servants. And our, our church sat at the end of the block, but the main road was at the other end of the block. And so he'd send us out to the end of the block and stand there waiting for cars to come off the main road and get stuck on the side road. And we'd be standing out there. <sighs> oh, hey, church starts in an hour and a half. <laughs> and the cars would get stuck and we'd push them in. Well, before you got to stand there and do that, you had to shovel all the way down and all the way back. But my dad was a servant and there were no cars that ever got stuck out there. Okay. Um, but I went to college in a place where if you wore jeans to church, shame, shame. Shame, shame. Matter of fact, I went to a college where uh, you weren't allowed to wear jeans to class. And on uh, chapel days, you not only weren't supposed to wear jeans, but you had to wear a tie. You know, they had to rewrite the handbook because evidently they don't want you to wear the tie around your head. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't want that. No, 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 it must be. You know, I was called for a lot of rules to be rewritten at that school. <laughs> some of them needly, uh, needfully, some of them needlessly. Uh, no, I wasn't really much of a rebel, I just was a literalist. Um, <laughs> I say where I had to wear the tie. Um, But there's rules and regulations that we set up in an attempt to please God, in an attempt to impress God. And when Paul is talking here, he says, you know, the food that you eat and the, the drink that you drink, you know, the festivals, the new moon or the Sabbath, he's, he's establishing some principles here that we need to really kind of catch up to us. Because what Paul is doing is he's laying down, remember when we talked about Colossians, there were several things that Paul was addressing in his letter to the Colossians. He was addressing the uh, pre-Gnostic movement, and he was addressing the Judaizers, okay? And right here, he's addressing some of the things that the Judaizers were teaching. Now, uh, I'm going to back up, and I'm going to kind of give you some stuff from our intro. So for those of you that were here for the intro, I apologize for the repeat. For those of you that weren't, that's why I'm offending the people that were, okay? So, the Judaizers were those who came to Christ but did not release, relinquish the law. Okay, uh, These were the people that would come in after Paul, and Paul had established a church and set, set it up and, and talked to them about the grace of God, the, the faith and the mercy <clears throat> of the cross, and they would come in and say, oh yeah, you need a little snip-snip too. You, know, uh, you need to remove the flesh in order to be sealed to the covenant. Well, we know how Paul felt about that because in, in Galatians, he tells us, you know, I wish they'd go the whole way and emasculate themselves. Don't stop with a little snip snip, just take it all off. Because all you're doing is adding confusion. You're, you're taking people away and you're putting them back under the law. And what he's addressing here is things that the law had established. Okay? Now, we know in Corinthians, Paul talks about meat sacrificed to idols and and don't cause your weaker brother to stumble. And, and, you know, if you're okay with eating the meat, it's okay to eat. And if you're not okay with eating the meat, don't you dare eat the meat. And if you're okay with eating the meat, and you go into somebody's house that doesn't eat the meat, don't eat the meat. So there's a whole lot of do's and don'ts in the meat. Okay? Really. And then the festivals. You know, I, I have a brother that refuses to have a Christmas tree in his house. I have a lot of respect for him because he was convinced that that was an error. Uh, in the Old Testament, it talks about setting up a tree and adorning it with gold and silver and bowing down before it. And he takes that as a Christmas tree with the tinsel and the garland and bowing down to put your presents under. Well, I stand up and I scoop my presents out. <laughs> You're not going to catch me with that. <laughs> right? that. That 
evidently he didn't go for that. <laughs> but but that's, that is something that in his heart he felt he needed to do. Okay? He felt he needed to do. I bless him for that. Okay? I don't go into his house dragging a Christmas tree. Help him decorate. I, I don't do that. I honor him and I respect him for that. Now, you understand that there are sins that are personal sins to you that are not general sins to everyone. See, this is where things get difficult. Because, see, we want what applies to me to apply to everyone. Right? Well, that way we all suffer the same restrictions. And it's really annoying when you have a restriction that God has put on you and you see somebody else that doesn't have that same restriction, just go... <laughs> really? You know, there are restrictions that God has put on me and said, do not do. And he hasn't told my wife. <laughs> That's unfair. <laughs> that is really unfair. But there are restrictions he's put on her that he has not put on me as well. And she looks at some of the things that I get to do in the freedom of the cross, and she goes, I don't understand why you get to do that, and I don't. I said, me either. But I get to eat certain things she doesn't. Thank God he told me I didn't. I was not restricted from them. Because some of those things would be hard to give up. Okay. You understand that there is personal sin that is not general to all Christians. Now, there is sin that is all Christians. Now, this is where things get really difficult. Paul tells us that everything is permissible but not everything is beneficial. Well, okay, so if Paul says everything is permissible, then why can't I go out and sleep with any woman or man that I want? Well, because all Scripture must be interpreted in light of all Scripture. Okay? You can't just take, pick and choose the ones that you want. You know, when, when Benjamin Franklin passed away, um, they found his Bible, and he had a unique system of highlighting used black ink. And the parts he didn't like, he just marked out. <laughs> okay? And, and that it, you know, what he disagreed with, he just got rid of. Now let's go back to what we said a couple weeks ago. When you come to God, you come on His terms, not your own. You come as you are. But you have to stand, you have to understand that as you are is what He wants to fix. What He wants to correct. What he wants to make better. So, we have personal sins that are not general. We do have general sins that we, you know, quite honestly, Paul makes it very clear. These types of sins will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. If your life is indicative of these types of sins, you do not know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You can't have him as one without the other. But that's really not true. Because he's Lord of all. Okay. But he's only Savior of some. Do you understand that? Because it says that on that day, every knee will bow and every tongue confess, Jesus is Lord. Okay? So everybody has him as Lord. You don't have a choice in that. Now you get to go your own way and do your own thing and live it up. But at some point, he will call to an account everything that you have done. Okay? Now, this is where things are really cool. Because if you have to come in your own power to plead your case, you're in a lot of trouble. Because not only does he know everything you ever did, every thought you ever had, he knows every intent of your heart. Hmm. The things you never got opportunity to do, but would have anyway, he knows those too. And you're held accountable for those as well. Because, see, that's the whole nature of sin. The corruption of who we are. Okay? That's what sin is. Okay? It's not this deed. You wouldn't do this deed if you were not a sinful creature. That deed would be of no consequence. Right? So the deed is just an outgrowth of who you are. Do you get that? you got to understand that because the good part of this won't make any sense unless you understand the bad part. Okay? The bad part is, we suck. <laughs> there you go. The good part is, he can take that away and make it so we don't. 
We are a stench. He can take that away, so we are a pleasing aroma. You get that? See, this is the cool part that we talked about last week. Now, here's the problem. We come to the Lord, and we, oh, there's a change. The ick, the yuck, the burden, the heaviness that sometimes you don't even know is there is lifted off you. It's gone. Okay, it's taken away. And we're given this Bible, and we're told to start reading it. And then we get the Ten Commandments, plus about 680 or so. And, and, and we're told, this is how you should live. Look, you can do everything you want to reconstruct the outside of your house, but if the inside is full of termites, it doesn't do any good. Okay? Do you understand that? So you can dress yourself up, lipstick and rouge it all you want, but if the inside is full of termites, your house is a mess. Okay? And when we go through all of these things, we are attempting to impress God. Now, quite honestly, here's how I put it as simply as I can to understand it. Okay? This is as simply put as I can for me to understand it. If you guys don't understand it at this, come talk to me later and we'll come up with something else. In my life, when I try and live to the rules and the regulations, it's because I'm afraid of God. I don't want to do that because I don't want to make him mad at me. Okay? And I find myself living according to a list of legalistic rules, your guidelines. Okay? I don't do that because I don't want to make him mad at me. But the, the thought and the intent in my heart has not been corrected, just my actions have been corrected. I'm restraining what is in there. But if I do it according to the way that he lays out in scripture, I'm not doing it because I'm afraid of him, although that's the beginning of wisdom. Right? Right? Mm -hmm. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Mm -hmm. Okay? And then when we move into that relationship with God, perfect love casts out fear. Right? So see, what we need to do is we need to graduate from being motivated by a fear of what he can do to us or what he will do to us, to, I want to please him. I want, I, I want him to be happy. I, I don't want him to be mad at me and kick my teeth in. I want him to smile at me. I want him to be pleased with what I do because I love him. I, gotta, I don't like Mexican food. For the most part, I just... Okay? You know, I, I just don't really care for it. And at the very bottom of the list, and probably I, I know Imelda would say doesn't even fall under the Mexican food category, but Taco Bell is at the bottom. <laughs> so whatever kind of food that is, that's like at the bottom of my list. Okay? Whatever name you give. But Christy loves Taco Bell. Okay? <coughs> now, I could... Give her some dollars and the keys to my truck and say, hey, go eat Taco Bell, enjoy! And fix myself a sandwich. But I love my wife. And I want to please my wife. Okay? Yeah, there's some times I'm afraid of my wife. <laughs> <laughs> you know that moment when her eyebrows disappear up into her hairline? <laughs> okay. <laughs> but that doesn't very often happen with Taco Bell. <laughs> But I take my wife to Taco Bell. And I eat Taco Bell. Now she is always very generous. She is always willing to say, no, we can go wherever you would like. But I take her to Taco Bell because I am pleased to take her to Taco Bell because I know how much she enjoys it. I know how happy that makes her. Now I know that's kind of a crude illustration. But see, that's the difference between the external application of laws to our lives in order to appease an angry God and the internal growth and maturity it comes from an intimate relationship with that God, and you want to make him happy. You want him to be happy. You want to please him. See, if you have all these lists of rules of do's and don'ts, and you spend all your time not doing and doing those, or sometimes doing and not doing those, because you break them, you're a slave to the law. What was the law put into effect for? It's a flashing, gigantic neon sign saying, you need grace. You need the cross. You need salvation. If the law could give us righteousness, 
How then was Abraham able to obtain righteousness 400 years before the law was given? How could that even be possible? He didn't have the law, so how could he be considered righteous? That's right. He was not considered righteous by the law. He was considered righteous by faith. Okay? Now, what is faith? What is faith? You yeah, you believe in what you can't see. You're certain that it's there, even though you can't prove that it's there. Okay? So, you know, I have faith that next April, a lot of you are going to be thinking IRS. I have faith in that. Now, I don't know what's going to happen between now and April. But I have faith that there's going to be a lot of tax returns filled out and sent in. <coughs> Paul also says that, you know, it's kind of like the wind. You can't really see the wind, but you can see the effects of the wind, what it does and where it goes. You know, I can see it coming down the road by all the trees going... <coughs> like that one we had not too long ago. We just finished cleaning up Dennis's yard. And how many went down in that one? Three. So, gentlemen, we're going back to Dennis's. <laughs> Cut up some more wood. Okay? You can see the effects of the wind, sometimes stronger, sometimes less. You know, the other day I was sitting out, I was uh, power washing the deck, and I got to the point, I was just kind of, you know, I was, I was zoning. No, actually, I was contemplating, why am I doing this? I hate doing this. And, and I was watching the grass, was just kind of gently moving in the breeze. And, I, you know, I wasn't even really cognizant that there was a breeze. But I could see it moving across my grass, and yes, it's because my grass needed to be mowed. <laughs> but I could see the grass moving as the wind blew across it, and it was, it was just awesome. You know, I mean, you think about that. You think that wind went there without God knowing? God calls the wind, tells it where to go. And I, I think that was just a moment of restoration for me. Now, you guys may not get off on blowing grass. You know, that may not be a big thing to you, but that spoke to me in that moment. Okay? So, Paul, let's get back into Colossians. He says, don't let anyone judge you regarding these things. Why? They are a shadow of things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Now, why are these a shadow of the things to come? Why is he saying this? Because it seems to me like he's saying, don't worry about these things now, you're going to have to worry about them later. Is that what he's saying? No. What is he talking about? Why are these things in place in the first place? They're there to be an illustration here on earth for us about what heaven is like, right? You know, the tabernacle and the temple, that was established on earth as a foreshadow of what is in heaven, right? Okay, you get that? I, I think what Paul is saying right here is that he's saying, not that you're going to have to worry about these things later, but on that day when I stand before God's throne, and my prayer is, I want him to say, well done. Okay? These things are going to come second nature, and I'm not going to have to think about them. I'm not going to have to worry about, oh, did I do this right or did I do that right? I, I won't have to worry about those anymore because it will be part of me. Remember in the Old Testament it says that I took away their hearts of stone and I gave them hearts of flesh and I wrote my commands upon them. That's what I believe will happen in that day. I won't have to go back to this to find out what's right and what's wrong. It will be written here. Now I believe in part that's here right now. That's when, you know, you're thinking, I, I want to go do that. And it says, don't do that. Oh, I really want to do Don't do that. And sometimes it's like, and sometimes it's like, don't do that! <laughs> and I ignore them both easily, unfortunately. And, you know, I, I don't understand it sometimes. I know God is telling me, stop, 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 stop. Just like I do with my grandkids now. They're reaching for that thing and you're like, no, 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 no. And they turn around and look at you like, yes? And they grab them. Okay. That's, that's me. God's like, no, 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 stop, don't. You know, why, why does God tell us stop? You betcha. You betcha. Why does God say no? 
You understand that when God's saying no, it's not because he's raining on your parade. He's saying no because he's got something better for you. Saying, not this one. Let's go something better. But God, I really want this. Well, I mean, you can have that, but that's junk. Let's, let's go to something good. Let's, let's put away the junk and go to something good. Okay? God's heart desire for you is good. Now, unfortunately, we're stupid. We don't know what good is. You know, again, we're like those kids that run out in the road. The road is fun to play in. You know, all kinds of room to... Well, okay, this is part of why I'm dumb. Okay, because out in front of our house on the road is where we used to play tackle football. There's a lot of brain damage involved in there. Okay. So, you know, we got kicked off the church property across the street, so we thought it would be fun to play in the road. You know, no. No, that lasted one game. Okay. And everybody had bloody knees and elbows and noses. Well, the noses was normal. But, you know, it was not cool because you tackle. Even if you're not the one being tackled, if you're the one doing the tackling, you still get road rash. Okay. But the, the road, I don't know why it is. It seems like a fun place to play. But how many of us would be a good parent if we let our kids play in the road? And yet, you look at God and say, what do you mean, no? I got this. I can handle this. Let's read a little bit further. <clears throat> Let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism. Now, we're taking a switch here. Okay? Paul was speaking to the Judaizers. Now he's speaking to the Gnostics. Okay? Now, I'm going to talk about the Gnostics a little bit more in just a minute. It says, let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism. Do you guys know what asceticism is? You know what asceticism is? It's a fancy word for saying, denying yourself. You know, like the monks, they, they would go and they take a vow and they wouldn't speak. Or they would take a vow of poverty and they would have no material possessions at all. Which makes me wonder, so whose robe is that? <laughs> okay. But, but they take these vows, and, and it's asceticism, and it's an attempt to reach God by denying yourself certain things. Okay? Now, that is not wrong in all cases. But if that is the only means by which you think you can reach God, you're wrong. You're not going to impress Him. Look, God, I denied myself this and this and this and this and this. God said, well, yeah, you went hungry for six years when you didn't have to go hungry. You know? But, but asceticism is just, just denying yourself. It's an attempt to reach God by denying yourself certain things. Okay? And worship of angels going on in detail about visions, puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind. Okay? So here, here we're talking about the Gnostics. Now, I'm going to read something here. I'm going to go back to the... Uh, this is a quote that I made at the beginning of Colossians. Um, this is, I'm just, uh, I'm going to go ahead and read this to you. A more detailed Gnostic theology is as follows. The unknowable God was far too pure and perfect to have anything to do with the material universe, which was considered evil. Therefore, God generated lesser divinities or emanations. One of these emanations, wisdom, desired to know the unknowable God. Out of this area desire, the demiurge, an, uh, an evil God was formed, and it was the evil God that created the universe. He, along with the archons, kept the mortals in bondage in material matter and tried to prevent the pure spirit souls from ascending back to God after the death of the physical bodies. Since, according to the Gnostics, matter is evil, deliverance from material form was attainable only through special knowledge revealed by special Gnostic teachers. Christ was the divine redeemer who descended from the spiritual realm to reveal knowledge necessary for this redemption. In conclusion, Gnosticism is dualistic. That is, it teaches that there is good and bad, spirit and matter, light and dark, uh, whatever. Okay, so really what the Gnostics were teaching is that, one, this is, is evil. This, 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 you know, these, it's all evil because it's matter. Okay. The only thing that is good is, is spirit. Okay. So um, what, what Paul is talking about here, he says, you know, now keep in mind, this is the developed Gnostic theology that came into play 
about 200, between 200 and 300 uh, AD. Paul is writing this quite a while before that, probably about 50, 60 AD. But what he's seeing is the birth of the Gnostic movement. And he's already saying this is a problem, we need to address this. Okay, so he says, let no one disqualify you insisting on asceticism and worship of angels. Now, there's a couple of different things where this applies. Because this applies to Judaism, which is really kind of interesting because um, you know that the, the Jews really didn't name any of the angels until the Babylon exile. And then all of a sudden they started giving names to a whole bunch of them. And there was the angel responsible for this with this name and the angel responsible for that with that name. And there was this whole weird thinking that came up in Babylon. And it's kind of like the, the blending of Judaism and, and the Eastern religions. Okay, And so they came up with all these names. Now, Michael, very clearly laid out in Scripture. Gabriel, very clearly laid out in Scripture. Those are the only two angels that we have names of in Scripture. Now, we also have the name uh, Lucifer, who fell and became Satan. Okay, So we only have three names of angels or previous angels in Scripture. But, but what he's talking about here is uh, this authority where an angel appears and tells you something, supposedly from God, in order to lead you into secret, mysterious knowledge. Does that sound familiar like any mm -hmm. cult that's out there today? Yeah, kind of weird. Huh? It's still here, still alive, doing well. He says, uh, going on in detail about visions, you know, you can't argue with someone that says they got it straight from God. What do you do with someone that says that? Oh, God told me. God, God told you? Mr. Koresh, God told you to set up a cult in Waco, Texas and do all those things? Oh, yeah, God told me. Mr. Mr. Jones, God told you? Oh, yeah, God told me. Well, you weren't listening to my God. Because those things that you started off early on in your, your, your cult flew in the face of this. One of the other things that I find really interesting is that they don't want you to read this. They only want you to read it in light of what they understand it to say. Because you're too stupid. Well, really, it's because you're not taught the right things, the, the mystical things. In order to make sense of this with how we teach, you have to let me teach it to you. Okay? That, that kind of flies in the face of God's Spirit being our teacher, right? Mm -hmm. Right. So, he says, uh, going on in detail about visions, puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind. <laughs> what does that even look like? <laughs> Us. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, really. You know? I mean, when we figure things out on our own apart from God's Spirit, that's us. That's us. This is what we talked about a couple weeks ago. Uh, earlier in chapter 2. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human traditions, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. Where is truth? Truth is found in Christ. How do we know what the truth of Christ is? He's written it down in His Word for us. Okay, He's given it to us. That's the measure whereby we understand things. Now, is all truth found in God's Word? Really? How do you figure out how to build a wall square? Because I haven't been able to find it in here. i got to go to someone like Paul or Matthew or Dom and uh, how do we make this thing so it's not like this? Oh yeah, you just do, 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 and, they, and they do it. I think it's like something that's just born in them. So, not all truth is found in here, but all truth we need is found in here. Everything we need is found in here. Now think about this for a minute. You're going to go, you sound like you're kind of getting close to heresy here. God is truth, correct? Is God infinite? So His truth is infinite, correct? So, could there be any way that we could fit all of God into this book? No. Now, every truth we need is in here. Everything that we need is in here. 
Remember it says, everything that pertains to life and godliness, everything we need is in here. Okay? So, moving forward. It says, puffed up without reason by a sensuous mind and not holding fast to the head. He's repeating what he said earlier in chapter 2. Okay? From whom the whole body, now what's the body? Who is he talking about? The body of Christ, the Christians, the church. The church universal. Okay? Nourish and knit together through its joints and ligaments uh, growth the growth that is from God. Now, guys, here's another thing that we, i got to talk about. This is another example why you've got to be knitted into a local body of believers. Okay? If you are not knitted in, how are you joined to the body of Christ? Oh, it's a mental thing. Well, that's not what this says. Holding fast to the head from which the whole body nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments grows with the growth that is from God. Now, don't get me wrong. God can do as God will. And I know there are some Christians, uh, I've, I've read testimonies of Christians, uh, especially in persecuted places where they were on their own. There was no local body for them to be in. That's the exception. That's not the rule. The rule is we are to be knit together. Now, when you're knitted in, if you pull away, things break. When things break, it's painful. Okay? Now, I'm not saying, you know, you're obligated to be at this church. What I'm saying is you're obligated to be in church. Okay? And I will say, when you leave this church and go to another church, it hurts this body. That blesses them. Unless you're bringing all your junk. Take it with you. Don't leave it here. Okay. We only go to the junkyard about once every other year. We don't want to have to go more often. But this is another thing. We have to be knitted in. To be knitted in, you've got to be there. You've got to be willing to open up and talk to people. You've got to put things on the line. You've got to open yourself up to be hurt. Yeah, I know. That's something to cry about. <laughs> because that's a very vulnerable place to be. But this is how God has designed his body to work. Okay? So moving forward. If with Christ you die to the elemental spirits of the world. Okay? See, what he's saying here is this is something that has to be. This is an assumption for what follows. So this has to have taken place. If you're with Christ... You died to the elemental spirits of this world. Why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to its regulations? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. Referring to things that all perish as they are used. According to human precepts and teachings. Now listen to me, you guys can eat whatever you want. But Paul makes it very clear. 72 deep-fried Twinkies is not beneficial. <laughs> okay. Quite honestly, I had a little bite of one deep-fried Twinkie and it was not beneficial. <laughs> okay. Um, you, you have to keep in mind there are hard things in God's Word. You have to accept because God put them in His Word. What needs to change is not His Word. What needs to change is us. Okay. These things have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body. But they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. You see where Paul's coming from? See, what Paul is saying is you can tell yourself, I won't do this, I won't do this, I won't do this. But if the desire to do this, this, and this is still inside you, you've not done anything. That seed of sin remains. You're doing an external application for what is supposed to be an internal change. See, who of you has the power to make yourself presentable before God? No one. That's the reason for the cross. That's the miracle of the cross. That's the transformational power of the cross. Is that we let him in, and he comes in with a broom and a mop bucket. 
Some of our cases, he comes in with a bulldozer. And he starts cleaning things out. Why? Because he wants a better product. Now keep in mind, this is all not just lovey-dovey. Because as our master, we are going to give an account to him one day. For everything. And he's going to ask us, why would you not let that go? What was so important about that that you could not let that go? You know, we all have areas of weakness in our lives. Predispositions to certain types of sin. Okay? We all have them. I can laugh at some of the sins that Christy struggles with because I don't struggle with them. I look at that and I go, why is that even an issue? Really? That? She looks at the, some of the things that I struggle with. And she goes, I don't understand why that's a problem for you. You know what? I wish it would just go away. You know? That's like Richard said. I wish I could find the button to just make it go away. He is forever made holy. Those who are being made... What? See, we, we are being made perfect. We are, we are given holiness right away. Not mine, not yours, his. Okay? The one that came, lived perfectly, not only didn't commit a sin externally, but did not commit a sin internally. He didn't go, Wow, did you see her? Wow. You know? He didn't go, Three's my limit. Oh, for sure. He, did, he didn't have the sin nature inside of him, so he was perfect and pure. That's the righteousness that is given to us. Now we've got to work out all of the junk in our lives. Okay? We can't do it on our own. And what Paul is talking about right here is your ability to do this on your own. Look, you're not alone. You're not alone in this. God has given us his spirit. Okay? Remember that spirit that hovered over the waters? That's the spirit that he's given you. Okay, you guys are dead. That's the spirit God gave you. Amen. you, you got to understand that. You are not a wimpy, left alone, cast off person. <coughs> Excuse me. God has empowered you with his very spirit to do everything that he has called you to do. He has not left you unequipped. I think Mackenzie quoted that a couple weeks ago in her testimony. God does not call the equipped. He equips the called. Right? So when God says, I want you to go do this, you can have faith that you are equipped to do that. Because God's Spirit is going with you. So when you look at things and go, okay, in order to make myself okay with God, I've got to get rid of this, I've got to get rid of this, I've got to get rid of this, I've got to get rid of this. Keep that list. Put it on your refrigerator or on your mirror or something like that. And start submitting yourself to God and letting Him take care of those. And He may tell you to do some weird things. You know, I want you to give this up for a while. Give that up. Yeah, you know, Duck Dynasty, give that up for a while. <laughs> I have never seen Duck Dynasty. So that wouldn't be a big deal That's for me to give that up. <laughs> <laughs> hmm, Scott, you and I will back afterwards. <laughs> I'm not saying, I don't know what he's going to tell you. I know God has asked me to do some weird things sometimes. You know, I still to this day don't know why at 2 o'clock in the morning when we were living over on Little Creek, he asked me to get up and go outside to the end of the walkway and stand out there. I have no idea why I was standing out there. No clue. Maybe just to see if I would do it. I don't know. One of these days, he's going to, I hope he answers me. Because it didn't make a whole lot of sense. Okay? But I was equipped. And I was dressed. And I went out and stood at the end of the walk. Okay? So, keep that list. I, I tell you, your list is going to be significantly shorter than God's. Okay? It's going to be significantly shorter than God's. And man, start working on that relationship. 
Start getting to know him. Start being intimate with him. Start spending time with him. Don't time your prayers. Okay? Don't, don't time your prayers. Don't time your, your Bible study. You know? Just get into it. See what he say. You know? He wants to talk to you. Now, I, I know years ago there was the whole talk about, you know, um, the rainbow word of God. Okay? And, and I'm going to tell you that having studied Greek, uh, there is no difference between the logos and the rainbow. Okay? So in the Greek, the words don't mean anything different. But I know years ago there was a teaching that logos is just the written word of God and rhema is God's word made alive. Okay, there's nothing in the Greek that indicates that. But there is experience that indicates something like that. Because you can read the same passage over and over and over again, and then one day you're reading it and God says, pay attention, bing! Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden it sinks into your soul. Mm -hmm. Okay, now, I'm not going to call that rhema, just because I don't want to fall into the same trap that other people have fallen into. But I believe that's God's Spirit teaching us as He said He would. Being faithful as He said He would. Turn off the stopwatch. Turn off the distractions. Get along with God. Jesus actually tells us, get in your prayer closet or your prayer room. Isolate yourself. You look at the ministry of Jesus. How did he refresh himself? Jesus didn't take me time. His me time was God time. He separated himself from the disciples, from the crowds, and he went off by himself, usually into a remote place, and he got along with God. And he came back refreshed. There was no me time that was needed there. The me time was God time, and we need to get that understanding in our lives that me time should be God time. Mm -hmm. we're, we're supposed to be dead. Mm -hmm. What kind of me time do dead people need? <laughs> you know? I don't, I don't go out into the graveyard and see dead people clamoring for me time. You can go talk to the, the funeral director. They're not clamoring for me time. We're supposed to be dead. Let us make me time God time. All right? Let's let him start bringing in us the change that he desires. Let's get out of his way. Let's stop impeding him by thinking, oh no God, I got this one. I'll handle this sin on my own. Really? Really? That's a part of you. Don't you understand? That sin is a part of you. That action would never take place if it weren't inside. Amen? Amen. So I want to encourage you today. I want to end on an encouraging note. God can do above and beyond anything we ask. Above and beyond anything that we ask. If you are struggling with sin, and everybody in here should have mentally raised your hand at that moment, because every one of us struggles with sin, God can help you. Not only can He, but He will help you. Start working on that relationship. Start getting intimate with God. Get intimate with Him. The one that can take it all away. The one that can bring the changes about. You don't like who you are, God can change that. You like who you are? There's probably a lot of people that don't. <laughs> God can change that too. Amen? Amen. Amen. Father.